Hey up guys, it's Rory from In Light the Shadows here and we are a men's mental health group that is out there to support and make a difference. Our heart in Light the Shadows is to create media mindfulness mentoring in a way we can really impact men's lives so that we can see them transform and utterly be supported and poured out love upon their lives. Uh, so it's, even if men are just struggling with a bit of stress and anxiety or across the spectrum, all the way to if they're, they feel like they just want to end their life or be suicidal. So if that's you, if you feel like you, you have no reason to live anymore or you just need a little bit of support, if you need some guidance about how to bet your life, some of your mindsets and your strategies, uh, we'll be honoured to have you on the journey with us. Um, and you would say, welcome to the Brotherhood. Um, we don't claim to have all the answers, but we are just here for you, extending that olive branch to see you flourish in your life. And we just say, have a go, give it a go. You never know what could happen. Um, have a great day. Cheers, guys. Hey up everyone, welcome to Enlighten the Shadows. Today is episode 44. We have an interesting guest with us. Um, it's a guy, again, that I love Twitter. I absolutely love Twitter. I'm following a lot of amazing people on there. And there's a, there's a gentleman on here who is with us today. I've been following him for a, a good year or so now. And I don't know, I can't remember how I came across him, but I absolutely love his fervor and his passion to speak on issues for boys and men. and. Um, I'm really blessed and touched because I, I, I went into his DM and I thought, oh, I wonder. And actually, he got back straight to me. So we've got him on the show. It's not Phil Mitchell from EastEnders. Sorry, Phil. I know <laughs> you've had that a hundred times. But yeah. today we do have Phil Mitchell, but it's the real Phil Mitchell. Um, Phil, welcome to In Light the Shadows, mate. It's all right. Thanks for having me. The reason I, I got back to you so quickly is because I, I basically have no life and I just sit all day. <laughs> Um, you know, on Twitter, um, you know, that's all I do. No, obviously I'm joking, but I think, you know, it, it, it's an important issue. And I think the, the more that the more that can be done to raise awareness of these issues and talk about them, it's it can only be a good thing. So, yeah, thanks for having me. No, definitely. And it's, it's quality timing because you, you've been telling me about this fireplace just off camera. So, you know, yes. go on, give, give the viewers a little cheeky. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's just, yeah, that, there it is. It's just basically a nice little way of saving money because the heating's gone up hasn't it you know which we all know about and so the idea is to get a fireplace fitted generally it saves money people that i see and i work with here so i work this is where i work and i see oh, boys I it. um it's warm for them and all of that but i didn't expect the fireplace to be finished to be fitted i thought it would go on for a while it hasn't and everything so when y your message came at the time i was I was, you know, we were cleaning up, but then I'm thinking, oh, okay, I've got, I've got to clean up properly now. So if, if I wasn't doing this now, this room would look like a building site. So you've, you've prompted me to put my finger there out and clean up. You've done you a favour. But so, so is, way, that chair, <laughs> is that is that where people sit behind you? And is that um, is yeah, one of those yeah, nice so, IKEA ones? That yeah, yeah they're, they're good. They are. And, and you can see my cat, who is also <laughs> called Rory. Um, 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 on the, the chair. I should say, if anyone's watching this thinking, oh God, I don't want to go see him. He has his cats on his chairs. It's cleaned. The cat is not here when I see clients. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, this is where I uh, see people. But again, because of the whole pandemic and everything, I see um, a lot of people mm. sort of scattered across the um, uh, across the country at the minute. So uh, whilst it's whilst wow. the pandemic's obviously, um, you know, had lots of negative consequences, of course, the, the good thing to come out of it is that, that people like me are seeing boys and men all across the country, not just in the local area. Absolutely. Where, where are you based then, Phil? So I'm in I'm in West Leeds, a little, little place called no Pudsey. Yeah. Pudsey, yeah. Oh, well, I'm a Leeds fan. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Don't talk, football and me and oh, sport no. were worlds apart. Oh. I don't know anything about <laughs> it. But um, but um, but no, no, I'm a Pudsey. I'm living Pudsey, so sort of West Leeds yeah. area. So I see a lot of people from uh, Leeds, Bradford, but occasionally things like Wakefield, York and all that mm -hmm. in person. But as I've said, now I'm seeing a lot of people online as well like this. Yeah, brilliant. One of my best mates who actually came on the show, uh, he lives in Wakefield. Uh, I've known him like 25 years or so. Yeah, good stuff. Cool. But no, brilliant. Phil, so for our viewers, like we've kind of slightly touched on it, but what, what is it that you exactly do and what, what are your background and expertise? So my, my trade, if you want to call it that, is counselling and psychotherapy, um, which is interesting because I've certainly found over re over sort of recent years, saying counselling and psychotherapy can put some boys and men off accessing it. So I often yeah, say yeah. to them, well, don't think of it as counselling, just think of it as two guys sitting, 
talking, trying to problem solve. And that that sort of language yeah. is generally more acceptable um, and more attractive, should we say, to some boys and men. Anyway, so yeah, counselling psychotherapy. I've been working with boys and men who have been affected by various types of abuse, predominantly sexual abuse, as children, adults, yeah. both, uh, for just over 17 years. I do a lot of training, although a lot of that training has been converted to some degree into webinars because of the pandemic that we're in. Mm um I, I write various blogs i do things like this so i do lots of things to to address uh the sexual abuse of boys and men and within that certainly within recent years there have been although not always but there have been elements of misandry sort of hatred for men uh hating right. men because they're men um expecting men to put up with certain behaviors and comments because they're men and all that um and within all of that there's other issues such as uh, males who have been uh physically abused by their partners, sort of domestic abuse, yeah, coercive yeah. control, uh, false allegations in some cases as well. Um, so that's kind of a bit about me, I guess. No, that's uh, thank you for that. It's brilliant because um, I thought you were very like streamlined niche um, in the sexual abuse, but it's really cool to hear that you, you're supporting people with, with domestic abuse because one of our team, uh, Stevie Rose, he's been a victim of domestic abuse. But, and, well, they uh, overlap. Yeah. That's the thing. The, the, the things can overlap. So when when some people when you think of domestic abuse they just think of the old stereotypical image of a husband hitting a wife or a wife hitting a husband and all that and of course it's not it's not as as simple as that um no. it, it, it comes in various formats doesn't it and domestic abuse can be violent it cannot be violent it can be violent and sexually violent it can be more sort of manipulation and control so there's all these different sort of facets to consider uh, you know there's some really interesting research uh, by Mankind Initiative, uh, by uh, loads of other people now. I don't want to name a few of them because I feel like I have to name them all, but sort of <laughs> highlighting how yeah. um, elements of sexual abuse are definitely present in a number of um, domestic abuse cases. Yeah. Yeah. It's all kind of, it's so interesting how it's quite interlinked. And for men, this is probably quite an intense episode and totally appreciate that. And I probably want to throw a little bit of a disclaimer out there, like anyone who's kind of been around any sexual abuse as you know as a young person or even that right now you're going through um if it's too much for you like we're not we're not gonna feel like it'll dig you out for having to turn it off turn it off do what's right for you fellas like this is what enlightenment is about we we want to support you on a level or if you feel like it's getting too much switch you off you can always come back to it because there will a hundred percent guarantee there'll be some really good things on here for you to maybe pick out if you would like but there's no pressure so i throw a little disclaimer out there because interestingly phil um I don't, I don't think I've ever said this on camera. No, I haven't. Um, I had, well, it's about you, but very quickly, I had um, a bit of like leak trauma a few years ago, like two or three years ago. And it was coming out in dreams and stuff. And then like, then it started overtaking my kind of physical body, even in the daytime, like at work. And I didn't have a clue what was going on. I didn't know about the brain regressive memories I didn't know that the body remembers, but the brain tries to forget all these little things. Um, and yeah, I kept dreaming of this school I used to go to, this private school. And um, lo and behold, they had like a lot of paedophiles there, even convicted paedophiles. Um, really horrific stuff. And then um, I was at a particular football club. I, I let people research. And I will, I will sadly name and shame him. Um, the, the head of the academy was called uh, Kit Carson. And um, he, he did some really like odd things. Like he would never watch us lads play. And I was about nine at the time. And he'd never watch us play, but he would wait till the end where in the nineties, like the culture was you showered, even if you were like nine, it was like really weird, but you just get used to it. And as a bloke, you do it all the time now, but yeah, he'd wait for us. And then he would sit in the changing room and like he would have his hands in his pockets like that. And you know, when you're a kid, you, you can't, articulate these things clearly but I felt really like um nervous anxious and like kind of dirty around him and but I didn't do anything um he sat there and I think he was like watching us obviously showering things like that and there was some other stuff that came out that he did um I can't remember much more thankfully um nor could I unlock the memories from my school so it was all like messing me up in a bad way and I just had to come to accept like something could have happened but I can't remember and just like tap into some forgiveness and things like that 
Um, but yeah, mate, it was pretty brutal and it, it made me feel really weird because I've always been really protective of children all of my life, like ridiculously protective. And when it comes to safeguarding myself, I'm over the top trying to protect myself, um, stuff like that. So yeah, mate, um, I've, I've had that. But he, he killed himself on the way to his court case for his al allegations of sexual abuse. So it's even on the, you'll see it on the internet, but really crazy stuff. So I, I, I want to be brave and put that on the camera. Um, okay. and I know you, you've been through some stuff, but I, I don't know what, so I don't know what, what's yeah, your yeah. So, story, mate? Well, just before I start, I've just realised that my TV has just turned itself on in the living room. Can you hear that? Is that annoying? No. No, you can't. It's all right. No. I'll leave it then. It's all right. I've, yeah, yeah. I've muted everything, got everything ready. Now the TV's just unmuted itself. But in fact, it's bothering me. I'm just going to turn it yeah, down no. slightly. Give me a <laughs> it's second. all good, mate. <laughs> but yeah, I'm just saying this to um, people, like, if you feel, like, ashamed or if you feel embarrassed, about these things it's actually all right to feel that way like i felt it um but i want to say to you if you feel guys that um you're in that place where you see me talk about this and you think something might happen to you look contact us coming up on the screen quickly is uh a private men's facebook group is safeguarded all the boys on the enlightened team uh, admins we've got well over 10 admins now who are trustworthy blokes who approve the post and then we've got 500 plus men who will pour out mad love on you and encourage you for saying that they will they'll absolutely support you and comfort you if you want to talk about these things on the group um so yeah that's just something i want to give you as an avenue as we talk me and phil are breaking this down talking about it but he's back again <laughs> well, <laughs> something else will probably go wrong at some point but we'll, we'll see how it no, all no, goes. This is so, good. it's real mate yeah. <laughs> anyway so yeah your, your question was what happened to me well i think what happened i was 16 when i went through what i went through but i think the thing is at the time i did not realize that what was happening to me was abuse and I can as I'm saying all this right. now it's a bit weird because I talk about my experience a lot because I at webinars and conferences but I guess I do it in a very scripted way I usually have a powerpoint behind me I've got right. a bit of a script to my head and I go through it and as I'm saying this now I've kind of just realized that this is me doing it off the cuff so I don't know how this is going to go but we'll, we'll see so good, um, but yeah so I was 16 and um you know I so I, I'm a gay guy and all of, and, and, and so on. And I think one of the interesting things, and we might get on to this later, I've always kind of felt um, when I was younger, I, I kind of felt like the world hated me because I was gay. The older I've got, really interestingly, I felt that actually the world loves me and supports me and looks after me because I'm gay because i'm a man it hates me and that's somewhat right. interesting but we'll come on to that maybe later but no so i was 16 um, i experienced um violence at school i experienced violence at the hands of my uh, mother never never my father at all um i um ended up living in a, a what you would call a grotty little bed sit in south leeds when i was 16 i my part-time job went to a full-time job and that's kind of how it was for me and i met this guy um and this guy i i call him mike that's not his real name um i heard he had, had he had died a few years back i don't know how true that is i don't know but anyway um and to cut a very long story short we met in a bar he was buying me drinks he was flattering me the whole lovely grooming stuff that we all kind of know now about how to yeah. groom someone and all of that and um to cut a very uh, i guess long complicated story short what actually ended up happening he would bring men round to my bed sit right. and there was a period of time where there was four it was either friday night or saturday night cause it was towards the end of the week i can never remember which one but he would bring uh, men round one at a time not loads and he would bring men around one at a time and i would be pressured to give them all oral sex right okay and i was 16 at the time now back in back then the age of consent was not it was 18 for guys to have sex with the guys i mean that's another story i guess in itself but um i think that what really stands out for me is that i never ever saw myself as a victim of abuse i never thought that what was happening to me was sexually sexually abusive the one word i always used and always thought it made was weird it feels weird and yeah. i remember saying to mike it's weird it's weird you know because i love you and you love me and and you don't do that do you and he, he was very, I look back now and I can see what he did, very, very clever, very manipulative. And he, he convinced me that sex and love are two different things. And of course they can be, they're not, they don't always go together. But he kept, he was saying to me that just because you're doing sexual stuff with these guys that I'm bringing around, it doesn't mean you don't love me. 
I'm I'm kind of saying you should do it. It's fun. It's enjoyable. Um, do you do you know you're 16? Do you really want the only sex that you have from now until the day you die to be with me? Really, at 16, you're missing out. Mm. And actually, you know, um, it's quick and it's easy. You you give the best blow jobs in the world. And so these guys are coming around here for that. It's a compliment to you. No one will hurt you. No one will touch you. You know, what, what's the problem? It's it's fun. It's it's horny. And when you're in a relationship with someone, you, you experiment with sex. And that's what we're doing. I don't, what, why, you know. And he kept saying all these things. And I, and I distinctly remember at the time feeling that I am such an idiot because yeah. he's convinced me that this is normal. He's convinced me that if I turn around to him and say, whoa, what are you doing? You don't do that. That's weird, which I did say, and he got very angry with me. Never violent, to be fair to him. He was never, he was never physically violent with me. Yeah. Well, he, he grabbed my arm at one point and pulled me aside to have a go at me because I was questioning him. But that that was it. Um, and, and that's when he started saying all this stuff to me, and he convinced me that mm. it was normal. He said, you know, and and I remember at the time thinking, well, yeah, I, su I suppose. Yeah. You know, I am lucky. That's what he said. He said, I'm lucky. And I thought I am because actually I've got this boyfriend and we love each other and we do stuff. But at the same time, he's going to let me do sexual stuff with other people. I suppose I am lucky in that sense. The difference is I was 16. He was in his late 20s. And it was extremely abusive, very controlling. Uh, there were four different guys. And um it was the last the guy number four, as I call him. It was him. He was very just just a, I won't say violent, but he was kind of leaning towards that way. He was very aggressive. He was very yeah. full on. The other three guys were very one of them was quite nice, actually, in terms of politeness and pleasantness. But um, the fourth guy, um, and, and again, I'm sorry for being graphic here. So just a bit know. of a warning. But no. the fourth guy, he had he had a rather sort of thick um penis and and i i could feel myself choking and this was the first time i said stop i what i wasn't like you must stop i'm telling you to stop it was that yeah. smiling laughing and as I'm, you, we mentioned earlier on about how you know some people fight some people run away and flee some people yeah. freeze uh, but another f is is friend and what we often do is we look at people and we smile and it's basically said i'm smiling at you so you can't hurt me because i'm smiling at you it's one of one wow. of the reasons yeah, when yeah. you go, yeah, one of the reasons you go through a city centre and you've got those annoying people with clipboards who come up to you and stop you and ask you questions. They're really nice and they smile at you, don't they? The reason they do that is because it's the theory anyway, is that it's hard to be horrible to people who are smiling yeah. and being really nice to you. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Um, so I was kind of, you know, duh, 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 no, stop, duh, and all that. And um, I didn't, I wouldn't say I got very assertive at all, but my, 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 oh, please, lowered a bit when I went, no, no, come on. I'm saying stop, don't. And the man said, guy number four, as I call him, said to Mike, nearly said his real name there, uh, said to Mike, um, yeah. oh, bless him, have you heard him? He wants me to stop. And he laughed. And, and Mike, who was always sitting on the bed watching and masturbating, laughed. And that, that for me was the point. I didn't think, oh, my God, I've been abused. What I thought was, oh, my God, this guy doesn't care about me at all. Not yeah. that I've been abused. Um, once it was all over, that was the time I made it really obvious that I'm not happy with you and I'm in a mood with you. And typical stroppy teenager, I ignored him and everything and all of this sort of stuff. And... Um, as, as a, and, and, he, and I think he knew, he knew that he'd crossed a line because usually I was just very compliant. But he, he knew that he'd crossed a line. And the line in my head was... I'm, t I'm telling you this, I feel uncomfortable. I'm choking here. I don't feel comfortable. I don't like it. Yeah, I'm asking yeah. you to help me. You're sitting there on my bed watching, masturbating, laughing no. with this guy. Yeah, and yeah. that, and I was really angry going, that's not okay. And I made it obvious I was angry in that stroppy teenage way. For a few days after, he was texting me, he was phoning me, and I was just ignoring him. As it got to the end of the week, I started to think, oh, oh no, we'll make up. Oh, it's, I'm, I'm missing him and all that sort of lovey-dovey rubbish. Um, and when I, we, we never, ever really phoned each other. It was always via text. It was kind of how it was. It was when mobile phones had sort of just started and things like that. And so what I did is I um, texted him. There was no reply. So when I phoned him, I got, I can't remember the exact words, but it was some like number not recognized. I never saw him again. I never, ever saw him again. Wow. No idea. I, I have a vague idea about where he lived. Um, I don't even think he told me his second name. 
Uh, his job was just, again, really vague, like business and, and people, something really random like that. Uh, I never saw him again, but I, I heard a few years back that he died of, I think, a heart attack. I can't, again, all very vague. But I think, again, the point is I was heartbroken. I was upset. I believe we were getting married. I'm sitting ridiculous now as I'm saying all this, but he asked me to marry him and he bought me a ring. I mean, it's probably a cheap thing anyway, but he asked me to marry him, bought me a ring, all that sort of stuff. And I thought, oh, we're going to get married. It's going to be great. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. naive teenager here um, who's been through a lot of crap up to this point. Um and um, so I was upset. I was upset. I felt I was heartbroken. I was crying, you know, at 16 years old. I'm in my bed sit, you know, thinking I'm going to die on my own. It's ridiculous when I'm saying it all out loud. But that's kind of how I felt at the time. Um, but again, I did not at any. Well, I did not at that point think I've been sexually abused. What I thought is um, it, it was weird and a bit odd. But actually, I've just shown him, you know, I like I wanted I really wanted him to know that I was more grown up for my age. I was 16, but yeah. I wanted him to think I'm grown up for my age. That was a big thing to me. If people say you're really mature for your age, I really like that. And I thought I haven't shown him that I'm grown up for my age ever. I've shown him that I'm really immature. This is my fault. Oh, my God. Why didn't I just get on with it? All right. The fourth guy, it hurt a bit and it was a bit uncomfortable. But the others, they came in. It was a quick, easy. There we go. Why? You know, he was telling me loads of people were doing it, all that. He, he's been really nice to me. And, and up to this point, mm. um, I'd had just a, abuse at home, abuse at school and everything. And so that that had a factor. And I think there's a really good psychotherapist called Zoe Lodrick. She's brilliant. She does a lot on trauma. And she has a metaphor, which I always use, and I always give her the credit because it's from her and it's brilliant. She goes, if you are in the desert and you are dying of thirst and you see a glass of water in front of you and it's dirty and horrible and mucky, you will drink that water. If you mm. have gone through life being starved of love and affection and you are dying metaphorically of that, you'll take any sort of love and affection you'll wow. get. That's and, massive, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? And one of the wow. things I wrote in a, an article I wrote for a, a magazine a few years ago was that uh, a, a child will, if a child's gone through life enduring and experiencing various forms of abuse, well, he will endure other types, he or she will endure other types of abuse for mm. a bit of love. Because if you're going to get loads of crap and no love, well, isn't it better to get loads of crap and a bit of love? And I'm not saying that's a conscious decision we make. Of course on not. On yeah. conscious level, we I do, think that's yeah. the thing we make. And, and I think that's what I've done. It's what a lot of people do. But it was only when I started working for a service that um, works with boys who have been or were assessed as being at risk of being sexually abused. It was only then I realised that I had been sexually abused when I was 16. So I was in my late 20s and I was working with a, a young lad who is commonly known as, as, as Jack. And... Um, he was being sexually abused and I was trying to help him understand that what was happening to him was wrong. It was abusive. It was legal. And, and one, and he just didn't get it. But one of the things that I remember thinking about was hang on a minute, what happened or is happening to Jack happened to me? Well, I can clearly see that what's happening to him is sexual abuse. Why can I not see the same with me? And whilst Jack, yeah. Jack's situation and mine was, was very different in some ways, there were also similarities and I was focusing on the differences, not the similarities. And it was those similarities when I focused on going, yeah, actually what Mike did to me, when I'm trying to say his real name, what Mike did to me when I was 16 clearly was sexual abuse. Yeah. Because I was 16, I was a child. And it was there was force, there was pressure, there was manipulation, there was coercive control, there was all Massive. of that. If he'd, if he'd have met me and said, hi, my name's Mike, I find you attractive, uh, let's start seeing each other and I'm going to bring loads of guys around to your house and, and, and tell you to suck them off. Well, I'd have been like, what? But yeah, yeah. You know, it, that, that didn't happen and he grew me over time and everything. Yeah. So, and I think that's the thing. But I And it was only when I was working with, with Jack, and I can, it, it, that's not his real name, but there was a, a serious case review based on how... Jack was treated by professionals because of the abuse that he suffered and um it, it, it he you know he went through horrific abuse mm. and the way professionals treated him was quite bad as well and if anyone want anyone listen wants to read it if you just go to google and type in um Bradford safeguarding board Jack serious case review you'll get it it's there there's a big right. page and I was working for a project at the time that's mentioned in the the report um that, that says we, we provided good and consistent support and people often that's ask good. me say yeah people often ask me saying 
Phil, what is it that you did? What what was it that you did working with Jack that was so good? I went, we didn't do anything that was that phenomenally amazing. We just weren't as terribly bad as all the other people in all his life. <laughs> yeah. You know, we sat down with him, we listened to him, we let, you know, and all that. We tried to educate him appropriately. But I think it was through that work um, uh, that, that contributed to me realising that what Mike had done to me was abuse. And that was when I, it hit me and it, it, it really... It had an effect, and I didn't really say anything. I thought, like, no, I'm wrong. I can't. It can't be right. And I thought, is it? And you down. You doubt yourself as you often do, and all that. But what I what I did, and I think it's a useful method to adopt, which is easier said than done, is take the emotion out of it and just look at it rationally. I'm going right. Okay, let me look at the facts. This is what's going on with Jack. This is yeah. Going on. Okay. Well, that that is abuse. So why would I not? I he he's yes he's a year. I was 16. He's 14 or 15 so yeah it's a bit different but we're still children and all that and that's when I thought yeah I have been abused and I kind of thought about it and reflected and I kind of got to the point where I thought but I'm all right now I'm okay yes yes to to get to that point now in life to realize what happened then was abuse is a bit of a a bit of a shock I guess Uh, and some people really struggle with that of for understandable reasons but I kind of thought "I'm, I'm okay I'm all right now I'm doing it. I'm, I kind of think I'm, 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 I've learned, I've grown, I've reflected, I've developed and all that. Um, wasn't my fault. I was a child. It was him. And, and I'm kind of comfortable with that. Um, whereas other people, I know that, you know, you have, I often say you have three stages of realization. You've got here when the abuse happens Yeah. You've got later in life, when you realize that was abuse. Yeah. I mean, some people realize at the time it is some don't, but you've got the sexual abuse occurring here. You've got, realization later on that it was sexual abuse but then you've got the decision well what am i going to do about it now all of this can happen all at once sometimes it's sped over years i've worked with guys that have said a few weeks ago i was raped it was bad it was wrong i'm trying to figure out what i need to do about it boom sorted we talk about it go from there others have have kind of said this happened when i was a child i've now had my own son or daughter and i've realized that what happened to me was abuse and i don't want it to happen to him but what do I do about it? And do I do something? Others will realize, oh God, when I was a kid, I was abused and that was terrible. But you know what? It, I'm over it now. It was years ago. I don't need to talk about it. Done. Okay. But then they realize that the effects of the abuse are, are adversely affecting them. So they don't trust people in relationships. They struggle with sex, they wow. struggle with anxiety and all that. And it's like, hang on a minute, this is really affecting me now. So what do I do? That's the point where we go to either drugs, alcohol, suicide self-harm etc or we think right okay there are other ways i can deal with it that don't hurt me so again it's all very complex and very diverse yeah no it, it is but wow you've you've laid a lot on the table firstly i want to say thank you so much for being so transparent like some people they're probably watching this and then you said it you said it how it is which is the enlightened way and people might have been like oh oh did he really just say that? i'm like yeah he did really just say that and this is what we're about guys like there are men who are suffering in the shadows. There are men that have had certain things similar, maybe more extreme, maybe a little bit less, like I, I've disclosed. And if we're going to be a place where we can really support men, no matter what their experience or their background is, like we have to be willing to have empathy and, and to listen and, and to stick it out as well. I want to say respect to the men who are, who are sticking this out, listening to this, because there's a lot of things to take home here. Like Phil just really quickly smashed out a list of, behaviors that we as men we can tap into as a result of something that may have happened and actually if we don't get to the root of it and we don't go there at least try to go there and i know people want to just ignore it but this is where these behaviors manifest so i what i want to do phil as well after saying thank you is like can we just like go into that a little bit how because what what men we we tend to do not all of us but we kind of like put it into like a box in our brain and like just seal it and keep it there and like kind of say to it like you're closed and try to ignore it but actually I think there's something there in what you're saying with these behaviors can you just break them down slowly for people like what people tend to do at times and how actually detrimental it can be well so you do you mean in 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 how boys and men sort of respond to when they realize they've been abused yes yeah and then how obviously it can manifest even worse if, if you know if we don't yeah. look well I mean, I mean it's quite a big question really so there's there's loads yeah. of different ways people can respond to dealing with abuse and some of them are arguably a lot more healthy than others so um one of the a, a lot of people use drugs and alcohol and they use drugs and alcohol because 
they often are trying to block out the memories, the thoughts. Um, the thing is, if you are having to use drugs and alcohol to block out the memories, that would suggest that those memories are not going away. And they're never going to go right, away. You're, okay. you're, if, when you've been through something bad, traumatic, abusive, horrific, your brain will remember that. It's supposed to remember that because if there are signs that it might happen again, you've now got the experience so you know what to look out for. If you have no memory of it, you don't know what to look out for, so you can't protect yourself. So you'll never, ever, ever get rid of the memory. And you're not supposed to. It's good that you'll keep the memory. It's about how you respond to it. So if someone is walking down the street, for example, and they see... Uh, a man with a big blue coat on, for example, right? And they see that man and they go, oh God, that 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 guy there, he, he's wearing a big blue coat. When I was a kid or where a few weeks ago in town or whatever, I was sexually abused or raped by a man who had a coat like that. Well, you will remember that. Your brain will make the association. There's no yeah, wrong yeah. with that. But it's about what do you do afterwards? So that automatic response is kind of normal. You'll notice it, but it's like, what will you do then? And if you start having a massive panic attack, if you start bursting into tears, if you start not going out anywhere, if you, dis you know, that would be the case of, right, maybe that's a sign that this needs to be dealt with. But dealing with it with drugs and alcohol, certainly in the long term, doesn't help. Arguably, in the short term, it might help, depending on what you're drinking, when you're drinking, how you're drinking, how many drinks you're taking. So the context yeah, matters. Yeah. But if you see this guy in the blue coat and you go, oh, oh God, that, that guy there, he... he he looks, he looks like that guy who did that horrible stuff to me, yeah? Okay, yeah. Oof, yeah. Anyway, I'm off to Tesco. Then you're fine. You know, it's fact, It's about how do you respond. You'll always have the memories, but something will trigger the memory. And when the memory comes from the back to the front of your mind, it's about how do you respond to that? And right. some of the responses I've said can be good, useful, helpful, some not so much. So um, the question I often ask people who are taking drugs and alcohol, I say, do you think you can go from now until the day you die taking the drugs and alcohol in a way that you are and successfully block out these memories and not have any problems. I don't think I've ever had one person that's ever, yes, I can. Well, you're not going to be yeah. sitting in front of me if you think that I am, right? Um, so it's like, okay, so I'm not here to tell you what to do or not what to do, I guess, but is it worth exploring other options? So what you're doing is you'll, you want to forget it. So what would it be like to actually, rather than avoid this, this memory, what would it be like to sit here and actually confront it head on? <gasps> oh, I can't do that. Why? Why not? It's too much. Have you tried? No. So the idea of it and many, many things, the, the idea of something right. is often worse than the thing itself. I've worked with guys where they're, they're terrified and panicky about going into a job interview and the idea of all the things that might happen and what it might be like and the build up, that's worse than the actual job interview. And for some men, in my experience, a lot um, sitting down, talking about what happened, which and I should say, you don't have to talk about it. Talking is one one thing to do to to deal with it but talking is not something you have to do you know um you can take other sorts of action but with many men i find that sitting down and talking about it saying what happened to you how you feel about it what happened at the time sometimes not even doing that just saying my stepdad did this to me when i was younger anyway i don't want to talk about it right okay we don't have to but how is it affecting you now and sometimes that can be more relevant. How is it affecting you yeah, now? That's a really good question. And yeah. it's like well it happened it's done and it's over I don't want to talk about it. OK, what's the point in talking about it? Well, you know, depending on how it's affecting you, there could be a lot of point in talking about it. And at the same time, there might not be any point. But maybe let's figure out how it's affecting you now. Well, um, I, I just I just, you know, I'm really anxious around men. OK, so it is affecting you now. So let's explore that, talk about that. And and one of the things that I do in my work is try and get boys and men to to see things from a different way a different perspective if you can okay, think yeah. differently if you believe things if you think differently and are open to different ways of looking at things that can influence how you perceive it then that changes how you feel about it and then that can affect different sorts of behavior um so the drugs and alcohol is a key one um but yeah. again um and i'm not here to tell people to drink or not drink or take drugs or not take drugs that's yeah, yeah. their decision at the end of the day yeah but it it's is. About, i'm here to kind of say is it is it harming you and other other different ways of doing things and all that sort of stuff um i think in regards to so there's the the outward stuff like drugs and alcohol and all that um some guys as well so for example when i um so after i was sexually abused at 16 i moved to coventry lived there for a while um but before i moved to coventry about two or three months two three four months before i moved away, i ended up being raped which really? is extremely tragic and i'm smiling because it, it's just the worst look in the world to go through this at 16 and then at sort of 20 years old to go through rape yeah. but the really interesting oh. thing was that when i 
when I was raped, I knew it was bad. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was rape. I could identify that. Um, I still, again, at that point, didn't think that what happened to me at 16 was abuse. That was years later when I was in a different job. Uh, but yeah. at, at, at 20, I thought, yes, I've been raped. This is bad. This is wrong. And it's horrible. But my, my um, you know, after police were briefly involved, my response to that was to, to if I'm being honest, turn into a bit of an arsehole. <laughs> um, so I yeah. started having huge amounts of unsafe, promiscuous sex. I started joining the gym. Now, again, I'm not saying that having loads of sex, if you want to have it, or going to the gym makes you an arsehole. Oh, that's your choice. But um, one of the things was I was, and I'm ashamed to say it, and I, you know, but I would go out, I would drink huge amounts of alcohol, and I would walk around the, the centre, the city centre on a night out, leaving my friends, and I would look for fights with people. Look at me. Can you imagine me in a fight? I, I, I have a clue, you know what I mean? I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have a clue. You know, I, I, I'm oh, a big shoot. fan of defending masculinity, but I know I'm not exactly the most traditional masculine guy you're ever going to meet. But I would get drunk, and I would go around looking to get into physical fights with people. And right. I think the most, I got pushed over a few times. There are some, sometimes I'd wake up in the morning, and I'd remember going around looking for fights, but then I'd wake up in the morning with a black eye and I've no memory of what happened after I initiate the fight. There's loads of things. Sometimes I did, you know, there wasn't an actual big scuffle that I think some big blokes looked at me and thought, you know, come on, mate. get lost, Mr. <laughs> Muscle. We don't want to, you know, whatever, all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, but um, but the reason I was doing that was because I wanted to prove to myself and to the world that I was a tough guy, that I am tough. And I am so big, interesting, I am isn't it? And, I, and, I'm, and actually what that guy did to me on that bridge in Leeds when he did rape me, um, do you know what? Um, it's never going to happen again. And it's never going to happen again because I'm going to show the world that I'm big and I'm tough. But the thing is, you can sh prove to yourself that you are to some degree a tough guy in different ways without having to go out and look for fights with people that can get you arrested, that can affect a criminal record, that can affect jobs, yeah. that can affect your physical health and all of that. Um but I think that's the thing. And when masculinity comes into it, this is what happens. You know, masculinity is not always, I should stress, not always a relevant factor in working with boys and men who've been abused. Sometimes it's a very relevant factor. Sometimes they bring it up, sometimes they don't. But for me, I, I often talk about the different responses and there's, there's, there's four. There's, um, um, and I'm writing about this at the minute, so let me make sure I'm saying it right. You've got um, restoring, amending, avoiding and utilising. And this right, is okay. I just, so, so the restoring would be that's what I did. So I'm thinking my on, on some unconscious level, maybe even a bit of a conscious level, I'm thinking I've been raped. My masculinity has been damaged. So I'm going to fix it. So I will restore it back to what it was like. How do I yeah. do that? I'm going to go out, be violent, aggressive, angry, take action, do on all that sort of stuff. Right now you can go out there as I as I was doing, looking for fights with people not great but what you can do instead is go out there and actually join the gym punch a bag do something take action you know when we get angry as guys we often feel the need to move and take action and we're criticized yeah, for doing stuff. But, we, but we're criticized for doing that despite the fact that a wealth of science goes well the testosterone has a role to play in that and we've got more testosterone than women so if we want to act fine it's better that i go into my back garden and chuck bricks at the wall and feel better afterwards than going outside and punching someone in the face. You know, we, we, we should not be stopped when we want to take action when we're angry. We should be helped and understood as long as the action we're taking is 100%. right. Yeah, I was not that. taking the right action going no, out no. the fights with people. No, but there but... is other action I could have taken. That would have helped me express my anger. But the thinking behind the restoring option is, well, my idea of masculinity is too rigid. It's I'd always be tough always and when you start to believe things about yourself with mm. words such as always should never must it's too rigid and that's what people struggle with so it's so so when i say restoring it's restoring my idea of what was rigid masculinity unhealthy masculinity that's wow. the, right? the second one is um amending and so this would be where you uh, no it's not amending strike that the second one is avoiding so this would be where uh, so whereas restoring is outward external behavior the uh, restoring is more sort of internal behavior so um i'm i'm talking loads of rubbish here. i'm going to say that again so the the restoring is where you restore your unhealthy idea of masculinity acting out external behavior yeah the avoiding thank you is the internalized yeah. behavior so the avoiding is well I've been raped. 
my masculinity has been damaged or I believe my masculinity has been damaged. So if I speak to someone and ask for help, well, weak people need help. So I'm saying that I'm weak. So that means my masculinity will be damaged even further. I'll shut yeah. up and I'll say nothing. And we go inward, we say nothing, we self-harm, then suicide comes in and all of that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. The third option is uh, amend. Now, this could usually come after the first two, where you, you kind of acknowledge that maybe some of your thoughts and perceptions around masculinity are too rigid uh, and, too, and, and, and not flexible enough. So you amend your idea of masculinity. It doesn't mean you become more feminine. It doesn't mean you abandon masculinity. What it means is you do you reframe. So, uh, if, for example, if a man is sitting in front of me and he says, well, um, I'm here and I'm in therapy, it just shows I'm weak, doesn't it? I mean, I guess that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it could be that uh, you, you struggle being here, yeah? Yeah, okay. So even though it's a struggle for you to be here, you've made the decision to come here, to do something that you struggle with, to try and fix your situation. That sounds like strength, not weakness. That sounds like you trying to take control. Oh, I never thought of it like that, yeah? So you reframe it. <laughs> it doesn't mean we go abandon masculinity and become more feminine. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that. Some people always, but it's about actually we can reframe masculinity. So it's like, well, I wasn't in control, was I? Well, at that point, no, you weren't, but you were under the influence of drugs and alcohol. You were someone who's stronger than you. The fight or flight process kicked in. So psychoeducation comes in. Now you're taking control. Yeah. Ah, Master. oh yeah, I suppose that. Yeah. So that's where <laughs> you that. so 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 what we call um elements of masculinity can be used to actually help boys and men come in therapy and go. Oh yeah, I can do this. I can yeah, I can look at this in a different way. Uh, the fourth one is uh, utilize, and utilize is where boys and men have already got uh, what we might call healthy elements uh, of masculinity, less rigid, more realistic and flexible. You know, um, and and that we, we can already use what they've got. Sometimes it's a mixture of all four. It, it really really varies. Wow, this is amazing. So we've got restoring um avoiding a, avoiding amending and utilizing yeah Love again there's, there's, there's no oh, there's brilliant. no i have to say there's no masses of academic so there'll be people might be watching this going there's no research behind that nah, 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 nah. no there isn't uh, but i've been doing this for over 17 years exactly you got your life and, story haven't and, you yeah and in certain in, in recent years I've, I've worked with enough boys and men to know uh what, what the, you know there is some substance behind this um but as in it, everything I've just said for some boys and men, it's just it's not relevant at all. It might not come into it, and that's fine. We don't have to we don't have to make it all about masculinity if it's not necessarily relevant. Yeah, brilliant. And on that note, I think I think you broke down really well how we can be groomed, um, how we can be abused, and what we can do to help ourselves with that. Mm -hmm. And you, you you're touching on masculinity quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, there's this thing called uh, misandry. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> can you explain like what it is do, you know does it exist and how how can you yeah. prove that it exists That's well when I mean. you when you sent me an email sort of giving me an idea of what we might be talking about when you said miss andrew is it real i was like oh here we go yes it is so, yeah. <laughs> Flip the computer screen <laughs> yeah, here we go. Um, it, it is so so yeah. there are, despite what's generally speaking miss andrew uh, you know misogyny hatred of women generally because they are women miss andrew hatred of uh, men because they are men right and um, so ultimately misogyny and misandry are, are attitudes they are beliefs right. yeah they're attitudes and belief that that beliefs that influence other behaviors and comments and things so for someone to say as many sadly do misogyny exists misandry doesn't it's no it makes no sense because what they're kind of saying is the attitude of hating the demographic of men that's impossible how can that be impossible yeah mm -hmm. i i you know we you can hate any demographic you can hate anything any anything in the world whether you should or shouldn't what it means is a different issue but it's possible to hate so to say it's possible to hate women because they're women but it's not possible to hate men because they're men it makes no sense and if we look certainly the last few years, there's just huge amounts of, of evidence to, to contradict that. Now, what a lot of people say is, yes, but misogyny exists in a very real way. Misandry doesn't. So, ah, right. So now what we're saying is misandry does exist. We're saying it does exist. Right. OK, so now we're saying it does exist, but it doesn't exist in the same way as misogyny. Well, that, that might be true. I mean, you know, there, there are arguably ways that it exists 
that are similar to misogyny. There are ways that it exists that are very different, yeah? But if we think about it, there are certain behaviours that could be interpreted as being influenced by misandry. There are others that arguably, in my view, are clear evidence of misandry, yeah? So again, not necessarily the vicious extreme hatred of men, but certainly in the ballpark where we expect men to put up with a lesser response because they're men, where we expect men to put up with certain comments and behaviours because they're men and so on, yeah? Um, there are many, 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 many examples. In this country, we have a violence against women and girls strategy. We do not have a violence against men and boys strategy, despite the fact that the vast majority of people who are murdered and killed and experience violence, according to the Office of National Statistics, generally speaking, are men. Yeah? Yeah. Now, what you get response to that is, yes, but who's hurting these men? Who's, who's killing these men? Who's, it's other men, isn't it? So why is what what we have there is we have groups of people with the mentality that it's OK to minimize the harm experienced by a person if the person perpetrating the harm is of the same gender as them. Really? What? What? No, it's what? And actually, do we apply that thinking to any other demographic? No, we say it's a travesty it's, and we need to help them. Right but it's to OK them. to do it when it's men. It's not. It's hateful, and it's also quite narrow-minded and judgmental. You know, there was a there was a few there was a, a video a couple of years back on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, so I'm not don't know how it all works and that. But there was a video on TikTok a few years ago where um, it was called the bag challenge or the purse challenge, where you had a sort of young woman in the front of the car, guy next to her, and she would be recording it. He would have no idea, and she'd get a bag or a purse and everything, and she would grab it from the back, pull it to the front, but whack him in the face with it as as she did it and then she put it back and whack him again and he'd be like whoa what are you doing now some guys thought it was funny quite a lot of guys were really offended and they didn't like it and everything and, I, and I, oh, the question i often ask is swap the genders what would that be like then oh you know, swap it, it right around it'd be uh it wouldn't it wouldn't yeah, be okay crack. and, and yeah. the belief often is that well men are generally speaking physically stronger than women yeah but, but that that so that means it's okay to 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 what hurt them physically no it's like you know um they have that in them women um biologically speaking can can give birth of course they can they can have babies it doesn't mean we should make them it doesn't mean we should expect them you know so you know we we, we can't we, we're taking this i think sometimes we are taking advantage of of other people's biological advantages should we say uh, yeah. and i don't think you know and i don't think that's okay it's not it's not all right you know there's there's so many other examples you know Almost like have, there's rigid views isn't it we have a, yeah. a, a such a rigid societally in the west we have such a rigid view of what masculinity or what it is to be a man oh, yeah. and it's like these stuck ways like oh they'll always be this way they'll always act that way and it will always be like that and then therefore so we accept subtly like those things that you've mentioned and so that it just keeps happening and going around because it's just the way it is right and it's like yeah not really. it, it's just really I can't think of any other word but what comes to mind is and, and if this wasn't being recorded and been sent out I'd probably take my time and say pause it a minute but the word that comes to mind is stupid it's just stupid and it's hateful you know we don't we don't apply that you know there are there are certain should we say uh, demographics that are known to uh, perpetrate certain harm but that is a minority a minority of the overall demographic we don't tar yeah. them all with the same brush because it's no. just a poor thing but we do with men and men and i, I said it today men are the most um what did i say men are the most demonized but least supported demographic in my view oh when, yep. Do you know what? When you see that, you take that in. Like, could you argue with that? Well, I'm, I'm and I'm sure some people would. And anyone listening to this will probably, you know, you know, all of that. You know, I'm sure some people yeah. will argue. Maybe not the most, but certainly one of the most. What? Maybe that's more accurate to say. You know, uh, men, men, boys, and men are one of the most demonized and least supported demographics out there, with, without a shadow of doubt. And I think, you know, what what we do is we rely too much 
um, on official data. And, and I think we should to some degree, don't get me wrong. But we have people say, look at the Office of National Statistics. It says this. Well, and, and absolutely, that's that's valid. And But it's all based on what people have said. It's all based on what's reported, what's recorded. Yeah. When we look at um, university studies, independent research documents, various things like that, when we look at them all together, cumulatively, a lot of them say that actually men and women kind of perpetrate certainly domestic abuse at equal rates. Absolutely. Yeah. But we ignore that. And, and 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 sort of government and MPs and all that we ignore it because we, we want to focus on just this. But what we do is we're not considering where it comes in. We assume that what's being reported and recorded is is fact. And to some degree it is, but it doesn't give us the big picture. It gives us part of the picture. What yeah. we have to do is think, well, you know, there's and I hear it all the time in news articles, oh, all these you know women have done that women are, are you know so many women have been experienced so oh, it's hardly happening to men or oh, that's the implication it's like well, well hang on just because what, what we're doing is we're in a society that encourages women to report and disclose and talk that funds huge amounts of services for women yeah, that, that that all and there's not wrong with that i'm fine with that yeah, what i'm not brilliant. fine what i'm not fine with is whilst we're shining a light on women we're keeping men in the dark yeah and, yeah, and it's like what men actually do typically because of because of our masculinity it can be our best friend and our worst enemy at times like we we tap into that second point which you said which is the avo- the avoiding and uh, or, or or it's the first stage as well where the behaviors manifest and then it's like oh typical abusive bloke sort of nonchalant side sweep comments but yeah I, I think a lot of us do avoid like we really do and it's a sign of like that what you you refer to as that weakness like um you know we, we feel like it's too much or actually we don't want it to, to to come about because it will make us look like weak and yeah i just think wow we like you said that support mechanism it has to be in place like we have to keep doing more i think like even even um and again i think it's a brilliant thing um women have a, a women's minister in in parliament but men do not and you know fathers for justice um like the Harry's report with one of my friends, Martin Daubney, he's fought a lot for, for boys and men. He was part of the boys and men coalition. And it's just like, it's still, we're still at this point where there's, there's not, there's a chasm, isn't there? There's not the equality that mm, we absolutely. should all rightly strive for, where we're, we're both fighting for both men and women rightfully. And it's just like, mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, it's good to mention Martin because he's, he's, I was emailing a uh, message the other day and he's agreed to, I can't go into too much detail now, but he's uh, yeah. to help me out on a project I'm working on, which no is... No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell, it's not tell, a big... Yeah. Tell him, yeah. honestly, say to him, say, oh, I, I was literally on Rory Green's um, Enlightened podcast and it, uh, very, very, very um, oh, man, good yeah. memories. Yeah, honestly, me and Martin had spent a lot of time together a couple of years ago. He might mention it. I don't know if he will, but it, mm. a very, very good friend of mine. And then just quickly, I bumped into his old man in a pub because um, he's, he's Nottingham originally. And I bumped into his old man in a pub in, in town, like literally two weeks ago. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, no, but, yeah, it was good, good bloke. He really yeah. cares about the issues we're talking about. Oh, in fact, yeah, yeah. We had him on um, episode five. We talked about toxic masculinity, which is kind of like what we're tapping into a little bit right now with um, Miss Andrew. Well, I mean, again, it's it's. A, I'm just going to turn my fire down because I'm sweating now. I was freezing. <laughs> much, Getting sorry. passionate, that's why. But uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Figure out how to turn it off. Actually, I've done it right there. Right. Um, well, yeah. I mean, um, and there has been. Um, it's a pilot study, and it came out. Was it last year or the year before? Uh, basically, it, 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 again, it's early days, but it's basically saying that to- toxic masculinity—the term, the phrase—does more harm than good. And it's, ba- you know, certainly with uh, boys and men that are, you know, considering engaging in mental health support and all of that, you know, it, it, it just doesn't help. It, it it does more harm than good. And some people say, well, no, we're not saying masculinity is toxic. We're saying it can be, but let's be brutally honest. So many people, the media and lots of, I, I said masculinity is toxic. I, I saw a tweet this morning that I'll probably share later on that someone had shared with me where someone had commented about how, um, you know, should, should we trust, should we be trusting certain energy that's out there like gas electricity and all that because a lot of it is is sourced by men that's masculinity it's patriarchy is this concerning and 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 how i don't how i you know how i 
resist banging my head against the wall repeatedly until I pass out. I've no idea because there's all this crazy ideology out there. Well, it is, it's bad. And uh, Martin Seeger, who um, is yeah. a brilliant, he's yeah, brilliant. He's, yeah, he's he's helping me on a project at the minute and he's been absolutely phenomenal, bless him. Uh, he, he said something to me once and it always stuck with me. Uh, so anyone who's listening, Martin Seeger is a, a psychologist. He's contributed to the, the Big Palgrave Handbook of Male Psychology, which I really recommend you read, all of that. Um, he, he said, it's like having a hammer. He goes, a hammer can be used to build a house, which is good. It can also be used to whack someone on the head. The hammer's not bad. It's the person who's using it. And he says, and he says it's the same as masculinity. The masculinity is not bad. It's the person and what they think about it and how they do it and their beliefs and everything else under belief. And I thought that just makes so much sense. And I often, often use that. And I think it's quite oh, a, a clear and powerful metaphor. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. So good. Um, before I, I ask you the Enlightened the Show's question, I want to ask you, um, so it's really close to my heart um, and, and the work that we try to do and empowering and, and skilling and equipping the viewers and making society a better place. Like we can, if we can just get, you know, more people with these basic awareness at the very least, like we, we could try and, yeah, improve life for men. So um, on all the stuff we've been talking about today, you know, whether it's um, someone who's actually directly being abuse whether it's emotionally physically sexually financially um whether it's actually a, a a guy watching this and he's actually thinking oh shoot i think there's a guy a mate of mine i know that might might be involved with this or um anything like that or, or so, someone who's on our group um or or in their workplace that might be approached by someone who's who's struggling in certain ways is there any kind of like little tips or kind of like awareness strategies we can use for, to support men better because obviously we do keep it in here and in here yeah no absolutely just... I, think, I think that well i mean the cliche one that you probably know i'm going to say and is, is talk to someone tell someone do something all that sort of um if it's bothering you don't don't sit and suffer in silence as the cliche goes it doesn't necessarily mean you've got to talk to everybody articulately and all of that but but do something take action and if you take action you may find you feel a little bit better you know someone once said to me boys and men are generally more human doings than human beings and there is there is perhaps an element of truth behind that and um, it doesn't have to be talking to someone it can be doing something to take sort of action yeah the other thing as well uh, two things if you are going to talk to someone what do you want from them think about that because if you tell someone, do you know, oh, I was abused as a kid, it's really, really bothering me. I think I just need to talk about it. And you tell your friend, what do you want from your friend? Now, a lot of people often go, well, I just want support, don't I? That's a very vague term. What specifically do you, do you want your friend to just give you a hug? Do you want your friend to buy you a pint? Do you want your friend to say nothing and just nod and they give you the impression they're listening? Yeah. Do you want your friend to give you some advice? Do you want your friend to give you their point of view? Do you want your friend to... Um, agree with you and slag off your perpetrator if you don't know what you want from your friend what do you definitely not want and that wow. so if you go to a friend and go look do you know what this i was abused as a kid it's really affecting me i thought i'd gotten over it it's really still good i think i just need to maybe talk about it i just need to kind of offload to you but do you know what i don't want you to tell me that it was my fault I don't want you to tell me that, well, forget it because it's over. I don't want you to tell me that I'm making a fuss out of nothing. I don't want you to be telling anyone else. So again, what do you want and what do you not want? That really can, can, if you tell that to your friend, then that can influence how they respond to you. If they respond to you in a way that you don't like and it's not helpful, then you know never to go back to them again and you fix, fix someone else instead. Yeah? yeah, but at least you've kind of set it up. The other thing as well, and it's easier said than done, is sometimes not always sometimes it can be used to, to separate the emotion from the logic yeah separate the emotion so how you feel you feel scared you feel angry you feel lost okay express that but what a lot of guys often do is they as i've said you know they want to take action they want to do something and there's no wrong with that but depending on the situation that we are talking about right it can be useful to express the emotion before you make a decision about what you do yeah, a, a, a common example is, um, you know, boss speaks to someone and goes, right, you've got that report late. I'm, you know, you're lazy. I've had enough of you and all that. The guy listens to this and gets really angry. He can feel the red mist descending. He goes from zero to 10 in the blink of an eye and his testosterone is prompting him to take action and he's thinking of punching this boss in the face, right? So rather than 
take action and make a decision and respond in that moment to that issue if you can feel that your emotion whether it's anger or anxiety or whatever it is if you can feel that your emotion has topped the scale imagine zero to ten. Zero, you're not really angry 10 you're massively angry if the if it tops again you're between five and ten that's when you've got to go do you know what i need to walk away i will respond to you once i've calmed down so then you go away and you acknowledge that you are bloody pissed off. You shout, you scream, you meet a friend, you slag your boss off, you, you know, punch a pillow, do something, go for a job, do something to express and get that anger out, usually in taking action, right? Once you've done that, the theory is that the intensity of the, ang the anger goes down a little bit. Once it's gone, the, the, the less ang angry you are, the less emotional you are, it goes down the scale, the logical brain up here comes online a little bit more. That's mm. when you're calmer, that's when you're more rational, that's when you can make good decisions. That's when you go, right, okay, I'm still angry, but I'm not as raging angry as I was. So now that I'm not as angry, I think I'm in a better place to think, right, what do I want? How do I want to deal with that? Let me make a decision about what I do. And it might be that you go back to your boss and say, I had to walk away because I felt very angry. And if I'd have responded in that moment, I would be responding with huge amounts of anger rather than logic. I've calmed down now. I've dealt with most of my anger. I'm feeling a little bit more logical. So let's kind of talk about what happened. Yeah. So again, that can be useful. If you make a decision, an important decision, using huge amounts of emotion and little or no logic, experience often tells me that it's not always the best decision to make. So don't make yeah, that yeah, decision. Yeah. Go away you know yeah, and and definitely. and express it in you know express the anger and all of that so then you can calm down yeah a few days ago when this fireplace was being fitted i would go i'm sick of this this house is a nightmare everything's going wrong with it oh my god like that's it let's sell the house well no let's not sell the house let's 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 <laughs> vent and shout and scream and rant and rave and have a fit then when i've calmed down i'm like right do i actually want to sell the house no i don't then you know, so yeah, again, that, that can be a useful thing. The other thing as well is if you are, you know, if you're thinking about speaking to professionals, you know, a therapist, a support worker, an advocate, whatever, then sometimes, not always, but sometimes it can be useful to tell them the support that you want, like you would with your friends, I mentioned, but yeah, tell yeah. them that you don't want to work with someone who thinks being a man is bad. You don't want to work with someone who thinks masculine is automatically toxic. You don't want to work with someone who, um, as someone once said to me, oh, I saw my support worker, Phil, and she said, I'm going to support you and I care about you. Men can be victims of the patriarchy as well. And it was like, I didn't oh. want to see her. I don't, and it goes, she meant well, but I don't want to see that because it, what, what, how does she see me? So it can be sometimes useful to say to um, um, the people, the professionals you're working with, depending on the context, can you take a positive approach to masculinity, please? Because that's, that yeah. I think will help me. And, um, you know, ask sometimes, you know, I've had people that have got in touch with me through Twitter and, and other things because they've seen professionals before who have implicitly in some cases explicitly made it very clear that well yeah men are generally just bad and abusive masculinity is bad and harmful and all of that and they've gone i don't want to see so I, I actually want to see someone who doesn't really have any views on masculinity yeah, or yeah. has positive views on it and that's why some of these men see what i do and they come to me and we work together um so yeah so, so like when when you've got a mate or you want to listen like be there to listen to someone or that obviously they tell you what they want and don't want what are some just some key little pillars that you use quickly like um when, when you're sat in that chair over there and you're, you're trying to be there for them in a supportive way what kind of pillars do you use um well i mean first of all so whatever i use i'm not saying it's the right or wrong thing to do yeah, what yeah. works for me won't work for everyone who's listening everybody's different of course um but for me when when i need when i feel like i need support so if i've had you know, if I've read a particular headline or I've had an argument with someone or whatever, I, I will say to someone, uh, right, I'm pissed off. I just need to rant and rave for a bit. Don't say anything. Just nod. I need to know that you're listening to me, but just be that blank canvas and let me go. Rah! Right. Yep. For me, that helps. When it's the other way around, um, again, I will not always, but because it's pretty obvious sometimes that sometimes I'll say to people, what do you need from me? What do you want from me? Sometimes people won't know, but then I will ask them and say, OK, what do you definitely not want from me then? People can often answer that question, interestingly mm, enough. But yeah. generally speaking, it, it's kind of empathising, as you said earlier on, seeing it from their point of view. You know, whether I, you know, for example, if I 
if, if I met a guy in a pub and he told me that his boss had annoyed him and uh, and, and it punched him in the face, one response could be, well, that's really stupid. Bloody hell, what's wrong with you? Are you thick? Are you going to get arrested? You're going to get sacked? Okay. A more empathic response would be, sounds like your boss really pissed you off. Mm. Your boss really pissed you off. He has pushed your buttons. You've got to the point where you just couldn't contain it anymore and you had to lash out. Whether I agree or disagree, it doesn't matter. That's but the right. fact that I'm seeing it from his point of view is good. The thing what we have to be careful with, though, is that sometimes we over rely on empathy and it's one of the biggest pitfalls. So guys have come to me and they've said, Phil, I saw this therapist and he or she was lovely, but they just sat there nodding and 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 kind of saying back to me what I said to them just with different words. I went, yeah, that's kind of empathy. Well, yeah, I get it, but we didn't do anything. And again, it comes to guys want to often do something. And yeah. um, so there's no wrong with empathy, but don't use just that. Don't over rely on it. If you've got someone like me who can talk for England, then empathy is generally good. If you go, God, Phil, yeah, it sounds like that person was the right ass. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'll talk and it helps me open up more and all that. Yeah. But if you've got a guy that isn't very good at talking, then empathy will only go so far. Um, so I'm not saying ignore it and don't use it. I'm yeah. saying use it, but don't just over rely on it. So that's one of the things um, I often use. But for me, it's about um, also as well, utilizing what they're already doing. So if a, if a guy says to me, do you know what? I'm an absolute failure in life. Do you know what? My my uh, my son is bullying someone at school. Uh, so obviously I'm, I'm, I'm a bad dad. That's I've, I'm having a meeting with headmaster tomorrow to try and sort it out. Uh, I've just been told I'm going to be made, you know, everybody in my department is facing redundancy. So we've all got to apply for their jobs. So I'm, I'm applying, uh, filling the form in tonight and I've got some other job interviews next week just in case it all goes wrong. And, um, oh, and the the shelf that I put up in the garage fallen down. And so now I've got, you know, I've, I've got a professional coming to do it i'm an absolute failure ah okay you could say that but if you not notice what you've said in all of that what do you mean well you've, you've you've given me you've highlighted three problems there and you've told me whilst they're a pain in the ass and you're really annoyed and you see it as failure and it sounds like you're beating yourself up empathy i'm also hearing that you're dealing with them what do you mean well your son's bullying someone you've made an appointment to see the headmaster to try and out the shelf has fallen down in the garage. It's annoying. You've got someone to come in and fix it. Um, you, you're facing redundancy and you don't know what's going to happen, but you're trying to apply and you're trying to make it work. And you've got, yeah. I mean, the, whilst I'm hearing that there's all this stress and hassle, I'm also hearing that you're doing your best to try and take control of it. Mm, yeah. Amazing. And so again, it, it's it's about that balance. That, and mm. I think it's hard to do, but that's what we have to do. It's about not saying, oh God, yeah, everything's crap and doom and gloom. It's about going, yeah, this is crap, isn't it? Yeah, this sounds really difficult. And I'm also hearing that you're doing your best to can take control of it. Yeah. And if we look at, you know, as I said, Martin sure. Seeger, I mentioned earlier on, he, he talks about archetypal elements of masculinity being like fighting, protecting women, um, not women. God, that's not wrong. Why did I say that? Winning, <laughs> not women. Oh, God. Sorry, if Martin's listening, we're like, Phil, don't be, don't be, you know, slapping him. Tongue slip. <laughs> yeah, I'll say that's not right at all, God. Um, <laughs> providing, protecting winning and things like that and control and i think yeah. whilst there's a huge narrative certainly in the media about well fighting and winning and that's bad isn't it but again it's like the hammer metaphor it they th those elements can be displayed yeah. in a bad way if you control really what good. your partner does and where they go and what they wear not great but if you are controlling your life your emotions and your finances great so again it's the context but if we use words like that with boys and men like well you're in control you're trying to take control you're winning you're fighting this you do again it, for many men not all generalizing here um it can be attractive to them yeah yeah and yeah so i think that's, take. Good. that's good mate yeah wow wow this is like action-packed love it lots of stuff for our viewers to take and me most definitely um before we do close phil um if there's a guy today who's watching this and you know it might have triggered some memories um but it, you know they feel utterly help, helpless hopeless and um they're actually feeling quite suicidal is there one piece of short advice you could give them today for us um oh you probably know about i'm not very good at short advice um, um <laughs> i'll try phil short <laughs> yeah my short um i suppose that if you are struggling the, the, there is there is there are forms of help out there there are forms of support out there don't don't view getting in touch with help support helplines charities whatever words you want to use whatever sources don't view it as weak view it as you are taking control of your situation yeah because it's not that it is or isn't weak 
or that you are or aren't taking control of your situation. There are different ways of looking at it. And it's one reasonable way is I've got a problem. I'm struggling with it. If I kind of talk to someone who's maybe a professional who's got more experience, then actually that might help me. And if they help me, they've helped me because I've initiated that contact. I've made that decision, even though it's difficult for me, which is strength, then I've taken control or tried to take control. So don't don't view it as it, see it strong and see it's control. Amazing. See, that was good. You got it. Yeah, I could have gone on. But that was no. brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, Phil, it's, it's been absolutely brilliant. And thank you for sharing bravely your your history your experiences uh, and and of course your wisdom and your expertise it's been brilliant um okay. i'm taking stuff away for sure i, should, I want i want to sort of just very quickly as well recommend i mean i'll just grab yeah it come on this is good yeah there is there's um, i mean there's a really really good book i mean if you have if you've had that so there's this book here called the palgrave handbook of male psychology and mental health it's very thick as you can see <laughs> It's not cheap, uh, I have to say. I mean, I think it's 130 quid, so it's certainly not cheap. And but uni but, textbook. <laughs> uh, but but the thing is, then you can download certain chapters from the Palgrave website. It talks a lot about what I've been talking about—that about positive masculinity, natural masculinity, all of that, boys and men. That's good. If you That's don't brilliant. want to fork out 130-ish quid for the Palgrave Handbook of Male Psychology and Mental Health, there is a cheaper version, and this came out about a year ago, uh, which is called Perspectives in Male Psychology. It's not as thick. Right. It's cheaper. Um, it's very accessible. It's all broken down. It's like bite-sized chunks. Um, oh, and some of, shameless plug here, but a little bit of my work is mentioned in here as well. Um, but um, Louise Lydon and John Barry, again, they know Martin Seeger. They work with him. Again, all very much about sort of good masculinity, how it's natural, how it can help and all of that. Yeah, so there's that brilliant. as well. So I'm certainly wow, thank you them. for that. Love that. I don't, do you know what? We've not had a book plug um, fr from the the, uh, the guest. I, I sometimes plug the work of the, the people. Like we've had Dr. Um, Thuraya, uh, she's <clears throat> amazing. She's based in UAE. She does lots of therapy for people and she's got a, a, a great book called um, Shit Zone, it's called. Okay. Yeah, it's where you're in the shit zone and it, yeah. yeah, brilliant. Um, so yeah, but it's great that you've put those for our viewers. Appreciate that. We've not had that yeah. before. So you bring in new things I, I mean I, I don't get any money from it you know so it's, it's not yeah, you know disclaimer I, but, I'm not getting anything you know, out of I should, it I should make that really clear it's not that I get any money yeah. out of it whatsoever but the, the you know the books just they're just so common sense and logic and I remember what, I mean I'm ashamed to want. say this you know a few years ago I was very much the, oh no masculinity is bad isn't it mm. and 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 you know guys we need to learn from women and, and all that and 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 you know we need to be more feminine and all that and you know maybe there's to some degree a bit of truth in that to some degree but my view was very rigid and i read these books and everything i completely i felt ashamed that i i that i saw masculinity this big horrible thing yeah. i kind of it totally changed my my view and it wasn't full of shouting and ideology and all of that it was just common sense and it just made sense that's brilliant yeah. that's i think mean, that's what men want just straight talk common sense yeah. straight to point that's good but no, thank you, mate. Uh, it's brilliant. Guys, uh, uh, for this episode, we had Phil's uh, Twitter handle coming up on the screen uh, right now as we speak. Um, just give him a follow. Trust me, he's got some good posts. I, I personally prefer the tonic masculinities. I've tagged him in a couple myself that I found because of it, um, of his trends. So you've got to love it. And then what you also see as well is actually the shocking um, posts. I don't know whether it's bots, trolls or real people, but it's pretty shocking. Some of the um, kill all men. Oh, yeah. It, it exists so i like to openly allow our guests to speak but if you follow him <clears throat> he exposes it all he puts the light on it so it's good and he, he comes with some real insightful stuff um our twitter handle and uh, instagram account it's coming on the screen that's in light and uh, sh1 and um on this channel guys subscribe we want to get this further and further out across the world not just in the uk we want to support men and create a community of fellas um and just provide quality content so that you can empower your life better because that's what we're all about is men taking ownership and action over their lives um, and we provide some stuff and they can do what they please with it um and then as we said earlier when i open up about my stuff we've got the private men's facebook group so that coming up on the screen for you too is that so if you go on groups on facebook the little free um people logo click on that and then just type in in light in the shadows and you'll have us up there so appreciate you guys phil thank you again really enjoyed it not a problem thanks very much cheers guys